Uh, greetings. I guess we're back for show number two. Uh, cows, context of white supremacy, uh, justice, and uh, gusty renegade. Um, hopefully everybody was able to catch the uh, first program with uh, Mr. Norm Stamper. I think that was uh, pretty interesting information, uh, having a uh, white person speak honestly about uh, racism that they both uh, practiced and observed uh, in their time as an enforcement official. Um, we're actually uh, on location uh, doing this program at the uh, Wing Loop Museum uh, here in Seattle. Um, we are uh, about to go look at the Yellow Terror uh, exhibit uh, showing racism, white supremacy um, against uh, so-called Asian people. Um, very interesting um, exhibit and uh, looking forward to uh, seeing, uh, seeing how things are going to roll uh, on the show. Uh, also looking forward to our guest today. Should be lots of fun with uh, Professor Trask. Yeah, we're uh, definitely looking forward to having today's guest come on the uh, program, Professor Trask. She is a professor from the University of Hawaii. Um, she's written a book. Uh, her book is... Uh, might be wrong. Okay, this is back in a minute. Well, that's fine, too. But we still need the 808 one. Um, yeah, forgive the interruption. Um, yeah, Professor Trash, he's a professor at the University of Hawaii. Um, as I explained, uh, if you were tuning in earlier, she uh, came to my attention. I was reading an article where uh, non-white people were, uh, excuse me, white people were complaining. Uh, they would visit Hawaii, and uh, they would be uh, mistreated, the non-white people local Hawaiians, they would uh, complain and, and uh, I guess were not friendly to them and white people were upset about this. Like, uh, you know, hey, they're not being friendly to us. They're not being nice to us. You know, this isn't cool. And uh, they quoted Professor Trask and she said, you know, hey, uh, if you uh, know anything about Hawaii and, and how we even came to be a part of the United States in the first place, uh, the native Hawaiians have every right to be angry with white people. And uh, She's written a book about this, about how racism and white supremacy has been uh, practiced in Hawaii. And, uh, yeah, definitely looking forward to have her uh, come on the program to uh, talk about her book. Her book is uh, From a Native Daughter. Um, she talks a lot about her personal experiences and the history of racism and white supremacy in Hawaii. She's also done a uh, film, um, an act of war, that's the name of the film, that uh, pretty much documents uh, racism and white supremacy uh, in Hawaii. Um, yeah, definitely looking forward to having her on the program. Justice, are you uh, on the line? Oh. Yes. Oh, okay. Groovy. Um, did you want to share anything for uh, about today's program, the earlier program with uh, Norm Stamper? No. Okie dokie, groovy. This is uh, actually the first time I think we've ever had a cows program where Justice and Gus T. Renegade have been in the same building, um, even the same city, first time. Um, but yeah, hopefully uh, Professor Trash, he will be uh, giving us a uh, jingle shortly. That's the only thing uh, we're waiting on. So we can uh, hear about Hawaii. I was definitely looking forward to uh, having on the show just because I've been to Hawaii and I have uh, kind of experienced firsthand um, both what the white people are talking about and uh, the ton of reasons why the local Hawaiian people uh, have every right to be angry uh, about white people and angry about their treatment uh, under the system of racism and white supremacy. So, yeah, hopefully she'll be uh, ringing in shortly uh, to uh, speak with us. I think it'll be very interesting. I don't think uh, too many people are informed about uh, Hawaii's history uh, and uh, how they've experienced uh, racism, uh, white supremacy. Uh, as we're waiting, I guess, for uh person to call in, um, Justice still healing up. Hopefully she'll be uh, not sick soon. Um, I did want to say I, I have reason to suspect uh, the program could be constructive just because I uh, have seen uh, quite a few suspected racists and admitted white supremacists. Uh, not only are they listening to this program, um, they are transcribing large portions of this program. Um, I can share a couple of incidents where this has happened. Um, one specifically, um, 
the program with uh, Lowell Magesha. I'm not sure if everybody remembered that program, but he uh, is a non-white male. He was on the show um, the early part of October, and he wrote a book, The Only Black Student, where he talked about um, being a black student at the University of Washington and how he was mistreated by white people. <laughs> and uh, he was on the program, and we, he and I both shared our experience of having dreadlocks and having white people assume that we're drug uh, sellers uh, because we're black and have dreadlocks. And uh, a white person has a blog. His blog is uh, what white pe- stuff white people do. Okay, thank you. It should be coming. I said it should be coming. Um, yeah, this blog, though, the stuff white people do, um, he put a whole post on his blog where he transcribed the portion of the show where uh, Mr. Mangesha and myself, we talked about how white people assumed that we were uh, selling drugs of some sort. Um, that's one example. Uh, second example is when Dr. Uh, Peggy McIntosh, when she was on the program um, towards the end of August, um, told different blog. And if you want to see uh, any of these posts, if you shoot me an email, I can uh, send you a link so that you can check this out for yourself. But um, second example of this, uh, the program with Dr. Peggy McIntosh, uh, a whole blog was started about that program, and they transcribed large portions of what was said, both um, questions that Justice was asking, questions that I was asking, and Dr. McIntosh, uh, how, just the way that she responded. And even white people, I suspect that this blog, I suspect they're white people, even white people were listening to some of her responses and saying, uh, this sounds very suspicious. Uh, it sounds like she's using the term white privilege to avoid being honest and talking about her own complicity in practicing white supremacy and to avoid using the most accurate terms. These are white people who were saying this uh, and, and writing out large chunks of the show to evidence this. Um, third example of this, the program with Matthew Fry Jacobson, uh, he was on the program in September, and uh, they were uh, pretty much, it was coming down to my definition of white supremacy and saying, uh, these are white people, uh, saying that they didn't think it was accurate, uh, that they thought there was a better definition and or a better term. Some of the white people didn't, didn't even like the use of the term white supremacy. And uh, they were writing out large chunks of the program, but what they were writing out eventually They had the evidence that even Dr. Jacobson, when he was on the show, even he conceded, yeah, we are the system of white supremacy, and yeah, the definition that you use is accurate. Uh, The same as Norm Stamper this morning. He said, yes, we are the system. Yes, your definition is accurate. So, uh, hey, uh, that's just three examples that I can tell you of right off the top where uh, white people have transcribed um, specific information uh, from this program uh, and have put it on their website uh, and have generated discussion about it, uh, in addition to admitted racists who have told me uh, that they do listen to the program, have listened to the program. And, uh, yeah, so that right there just lives, gives me one reason to suspect that the program could be constructive. Uh, again, Dr. Francis Cress Welsing, her suggestion was for non-white people, listen to these programs uh, back-to-back. She said she thinks it would be very constructive if non-white people – Uh, listened to white people speaking about racism, white supremacy uh, together. She thinks that would be good. Uh, So that's straight from Dr. Welsing. Uh, Hopefully we can get her back on the program soon. Um, If I had to give any other uh, suggestions or things you could do to uh, assist, uh, number one, make sure you favorite the show. That would be very helpful. Favorite the show, all you have to do is click the uh, heart on the little player on the Blog Talk radio page. Click the heart. That would be helpful. Favorite the show. Um, If you know any white people who you think would be uh, willing to help out, get them to go to my blog, racism-notes.blogspot.com, and get them to uh, donate to the cows. There's a donate button on the blog. Get some white people and see if they will help out and donate a few bucks to the cows. That would be very helpful. Um, Let's see. Or if you could get a white person to get us a sponsor, that would be fabulous. Super, super helpful. Um, in addition, if you have a blog, this is something anybody can do. If you have a blog, um, you can 
put the player for this show on your blog. Very easy. You could do that in like three minutes. All you have to do is cut and paste the HTML code. Um, it should be right on the uh, it should be right on the Blog Talk site. There's a little button you can press that says uh, promote this show. Um, press that button and it will show you uh, the code for getting the player. You can get the single episode player or you can get the multi-episode player. Uh, and you can put it on your site. Super helpful. Um, people can listen to the show at your site and they won't even have to leave your page. So if you put it on your, uh, if you put it on your page, uh, if you put the show on your page, um, people can listen to the cows right on your uh, your blog or your website, and uh, they won't even have to leave your page. They can stay right there. Um, yeah, that's another thing you can do that would be helpful. Um, think of any other tidbits I can think of that would be uh, that would be good for the cows. Um, other than that, just sharing sharing the program, letting other people know. Um, Oh, life is hard. Uh, Professor Trask is not, has not uh, called in yet, unfortunately. Life is hard. Oh, no more help. Uh, this is, again, we're on location. We're at the Wayne uh, Wingley Museum in Seattle, um, not uh, normally in front of a computer or at least uh, running distance from a computer uh, to be able to uh, access. Uh, who's calling in and what have you, but Professor Trask has not given us a jingle. Um, actually, hold on one second. This is what I could do if I had a phone. I would have technology, and I would have a lot more skill at being able to pull off programs. Bang, made the call. We now have our guest. Uh, our guest for today's program, uh, I read her book, uh, her book uh, from a native daughter. Uh, I don't think it's an understatement. We have a warrior on the program today. Uh, she is a tough, tough woman. Uh, non-white female. She is a professor at the University of Hawaii, um, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to botch her first name. I am incompetent. This is one of, uh, one of my skills I need to improve on, so hopefully she can say it for me uh, two or three times and I'll be able to say it correctly. Uh, but her last name I can handle, Professor Trask, the University of Hawaii. Are you with us? Yes, I am. Outstanding. Can you can you say your whole name so they can hear uh, your entire name for us, please? Sure. It's How Nani. That's my first name, How Nani, and my last okay. name is Trask. Okay. Uh, How Nani. Am I yes. saying it correctly? Yes, you are. Outstanding. Outstanding. <laughs> um, could you please uh, could you share with our audience just a little bit about who you are and uh, the work that you do, so they have a better understanding of who you are, Professor Trask? Sure. I'm Hawaiian, a native of the Hawaiian Islands, and uh, I have been a professor at the University of Hawaii teaching in the Hawaiian Studies program, and it's been about maybe 15 years now. And we have, as a group of us, because we're all Hawaiians in Hawaiian Studies, brought the campus 
a new way to bring Hawaiians to the university, and that has been our goal for over 20 years. And the university had had several other kinds of entities for uh, various ethnic groups, but not one for Hawaiians, which is ironic given that we're called Hawaii over here. And uh, so they finally did that several uh, years ago, and now we have a very large group of Hawaiians that come to Hawaiian Studies, and we're now having to move into an MA and a PhD program. So it's been wow. very successful. Yeah, wow. it's been very successful. Impressive, impressive. It is, and I look back at the, the our elders who started the whole idea. None of them are here now with us because they died in transit, but they died in their 80s and 90s, and we're all grateful that they came to our uh, to our idea that we should have a center for Hawaiian studies. Wow. Um, just for my own clarification, I actually. Uh, <laughs> I, as I read your book, I, I snickered because I didn't know how you were going to respond. I actually have been to Hawaii, uh, so I was probably one of the tourists who uh, yes. outnumbered the <laughs> native. Uh, uh, which island are you on specifically? Oahu. Okay, okay. That's the same one I was on. Okay. Um, I think I was actually at your school. Um, mm -hmm. I was telling our visitors before the program, I actually saw the Lakers do a preseason game at the University of Hawaii. Mm -hmm. um, it was a pretty cool experience to be there. Um, my uh, my co-host, she is uh, all of ten, and uh, do you want to wait? Okay, uh, I'll come to uh, Justice in a minute. See if she has some uh, has some questions. Um, I know a lot of our listeners they just are not informed about how um, racism, white supremacy, has been practiced in Hawaii. So I want to get to that. But before I do, uh, just clarify for our listeners, you are a non-white female, is that correct? Yes. Okay. Um, I'm native, actually, is how we call ourselves. We're Native Hawaiian. Native, okay. That's how I'll reference you then, Native mm -hmm. Hawaiian. Um, this program, The Context of White Supremacy, uh, I have unfortunately concluded that we are in a global system of racism, white supremacy, and the definition that I use for that is uh, <clears throat> a global system of people who classify themselves as white and are dedicated to abusing and or subjugating everyone in the known universe whom they classify as not white. Uh, do you think such a system exists, and do you think that is an accurate definition? Absolutely, and especially when you look at the Americas. The Americas were colonized by white people out of Europe, and they proceeded as soon as they reached the Americas to begin extermination of the native peoples. And that's been written about many, many times by very good scholars that said this was the entire plan. And, of course, we know that the United States has managed not only to eliminate native people, but then to cordon them off in things called reservations. The same is true for Central and South America. The same is true for Canada. So the idea of exterminating Native peoples, people of color, is very real. Mm. Wow. Um, I, I was telling our listeners, um, real tree, and the same thing really that I, I said with you when I spoke with you earlier about coming on the program, I think it's important for all non-white people to kind of become more informed about how other non-white people have been mistreated. Uh, yes. because a lot of the same tactics have been used against non-white people worldwide in many different areas. Um, I was hoping you could share, <clears throat> I'm sorry, if you could give us uh, kind of a, a brief summary of how Hawaii came to be a part of the United States in the first place, because I think that's a really uh, brutal illustration of how white supremacy works. Yes, the missionaries came over uh and we had already been here for 2,000 years and decided that they would proselytize and turn these heathens into good Christians. And the result of that was uh, they introduced all kinds of diseases. And just before they arrived, we had someone named Captain Cook, who was British, who was traveling all over the Pacific trying to nail down what could be part of the British Empire. And he made a fatal mistake by coming to Hawaii, and he tried to take our ruling king at that time uh, hostage, and the Hawaiians killed him. 
Mm-hmm. So when we're always arguing, for example, with the Maoris and with our other good Polynesian cousins in the Pacific, we say, well, listen, the Hawaiians killed Captain Cook, and none of you can claim that, so just don't argue with us. We are the best. Mm-hmm. And from then on, it's been that way, that the colonizer comes, the colonizer lays claim to the land, and especially to the women, and then lands their troops and says, now you're a part of us. And that's how we became part of the United States. The United States invaded our country, imprisoned our leaders, banned our language, and took over Hawaii. And today, we have 26 military bases, American military bases in Hawaii, which shows you what the strategic purpose was to take us in the first place. Wow. Wow. It's amazing, um, isn't it? 26 it, it, military bases in an it, archipelago. <laughs> hmm. It sounds, uh, oh, wait a minute, I want to make sure I get, my co-host is Ted, and she doesn't know what that is. Um, Could you explain what an archipelago is? Yes, an archipelago is uh, more than just one island in a place where the what we call island chain uh, shows the beginning, the smallest of our island chain. Is, it was the first volcanic eruption, and that's a very small place. And then it goes on to the biggest ones, which are now called the Big Island, uh, which is still having active volcanoes, fortunately. Um, Pele is the name of our volcano. It's a woman. She uh, brings so much lava into the Big Island that the island has expanded now enormously since I was born, for example. I was born in 1999. Wow. So we are still as uh, an archipelago uh, expanding. Wow. Wow. Yeah, what you said amazing. <clears throat> about the the 26 uh, military installations, it sounds nutty until you go there and you see the military presence when you're there. Um, And I I definitely want to touch on that more as as we get into the program because, I mean, it's startling to be there and just be hanging out on the beach doing your thing, and then you keep seeing all these army trucks rolling by, like, what is going on? Yeah, and also if you look at the strategic location of Hawaii, you can see that the fight for the control of the Pacific begins here. Everybody thinks it begins in the South Pacific. No, it begins in Hawaii because that means that the United States will have hegemony over the Pacific. If you put 26 military bases in some place, you're going to control the Pacific. And, of course, they do, Mm. just as they control the moon and every other thing they took. (laughs) I know. Don't you love that, putting the American flag on the moon? (laughs) Talk about hubris and arrogance. (sighs) That, that is white supremacy. Uh, we own everything, including the stars in the sky. It's all ours. Say, and so they'll land on some dead stars. And <laughs> there. Hope they die there. You know. Oh, that that is white supremacy. And our guest, uh, Professor Trag, you see why I said she is a warrior. When I was reading the book, like boy, she is she is tough. Thank you. Uh, no, no problem, no problem. Uh, oh. Uh, Oh, okay. Um, my co-host, I wanted to check because I think she might have some questions. Do you, uh, right on, justice, go right ahead. Do you work to produce justice? I can't hear you. I'm sorry. Can you speak louder? Do you work to produce justice? Oh, yes. I think that's probably what all Native people struggle for is that uh, if you don't have justice, you can't make any um decisions about anything. You can't decide which part of your homeland you once owned completely now belongs to you and to us as a people. Uh, You can't make any kind of judgment regarding moving forward unless you know what justice means. And in our case, justice means that the United States, after 100 years, finally apologized, which we had been saying they have to admit that they tried to overthrow our government, succeeded in doing so, and then banned our language. So, yes, of course, justice is is kind of the guiding end uh, of why you struggle against oppression. Okay, how do you work to produce justice? How do I work to what? To produce justice. One of the things that I think all uh, oppressed people understand is that whatever was taken from them has to be cataloged, and they have to demand that it be returned. Um, And that's what theft is. So, for example, it took Hawaiians almost 100 years to have the state of Hawaii acknowledge that the language of Hawaii is 
indigenous Hawaiian language, not English. And that finally was accepted. And now the state of Hawaii has two languages, English and Hawaiian. And what's important about that is now we can have schools where Hawaiian is taught and the students don't have to pay for it because it's a state language. That was one of our big demands and we finally won it. Another one is the preservation and acknowledgement by the United States that what they did was wrong. And not only that, but they need to compensate for the overthrow and for the taking of our lands and uh, for the diaspora that now Hawaiians experience because they have no place to live since it's been taken over by, for example, 26 military bases. That's really the value of Hawaii to the United States is uh, our location in the Pacific. So all of those situations are part of what we struggle with every day as Native Hawaiians. Do you have any more questions? <coughs> Did white people mistreat you? Oh, yes. I mean, that's part of the takeover. Um, when you invade someone's country and you take away their governance and you put their leaders in prison and you divide them by blood quantum, there's no question that that's racism. And, uh, and not only racism, but that they're doing a tremendous international wrong by taking away what was your motherland. If so, can you tell me how you fix those problems? Oh, there are all kinds of ways. I mean, Europeans, for example, South Africa, I'd rather use that as an example. Um, you have to fight against the enemy. And um, South Africa, for example, fought for years and years and years and had their people in prison before they threw out the Boers, the people who came to colonize them. And I'm fortunate to say that I was invited to their first big, huge conference um, after they were, they were let free and that their... Um, first elected leader was uh, Nelson Mandela, who won the Nobel Prize for exactly what he had been doing all those years. And that's a perfect example. And it, it for the world, it was a great um, inspiration for all of us. That was all for now. Do you have another question? Hello. Hello. Uh, can you hear that me, will, Professor Trent? Yeah. Yes. Oh, okay. Groovy. Um, yeah, I, I have several <laughs> questions I would like to ask. Um, I thought it was uh, very interesting in your book. Um, you touched on, and you already alluded to, uh, the impact that Christianity had and how that was used to uh, really to dominate and take yeah. over uh, Native Hawaiian people. Can you can you really share in depth how that worked? Well, when the missionaries came, they brought all of these diseases. And for our cultural reference, if you die of a disease, because most we didn't have any of the diseases that the West brought, there was something wrong, something cataclysmically wrong. And in that case, that was accurate. When the missionaries came, they brought everything from the common flu to syphilis. And the Hawaiian population collapsed, as most uh, untouched populations do in the Pacific, uh, to something like 90%. So what that meant was not only our lands taken from us, not only were we conquered, but we didn't have enough people to resist it sufficiently, and we still don't to this very day. And when the overthrow took place, uh, which was in the latter part of the 19th century, the purpose of it was to have the strategic location of, of Hawaii, and that was to belong to the United States, which it still does. And so that's the, that's the cause for taking Hawaii and not the one that's always romanticized, which is that the United States was very generous because, as we were told, the Japanese could have taken it. Well, the reason the Japanese bombed Pearl Harbor is because the United States put it there. So um, the humor of all this to me is that they make us feel as though here's two conquerors and you should be lucky you're with the American one and not the Japanese one, as opposed to what we say, which is this was our country for 2,000 years and you took it away from us. Wow. Wow. Um, <laughs> just uh, 
again, real privilege to uh, have you on the program today to get this information. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, you, you alluded to uh, the disease and Christianity and the impact that that had. I also thought it was very important because I think uh, Native Americans and uh, really I think non-white people worldwide have had just a horrendous experience with alcohol, and you touched on that as well in your book, yes. and you share uh, some of that history as well as to how that was used against uh, Native Hawaiians. And I think part of the problem is that wherever we go as Native people, we find similar circumstances. Take the land, impoverish the people, depress them to the point where they become addicts of one sort or another, and then eventually they'll die out and the colonizer will own everything. And that's definitely true throughout the Pacific. I know wow. it's, it's such a terrible tale that when we visit each other, when the Hawaiians visit the Tahitians or we visit the Maori, we have the same stories. Mm-hmm. They're um, endemic to the Pacific. Or I just finished teaching a class on uh, Pacific Island women's poetry, and everybody in the class is a, oh, not, not in surprise, are Pacific Island people all female, who are sitting there talking for two and a half hours about what's happened to their country, their language, their their behavior patterns, um, what the difference is between the Maori who were conquered by the British versus the Hawaiians who were conquered by Americans um, versus Tahiti, which is French. And you can see where the whole um, addiction that, that the first world has to colonizing is, I, mean, I, don't, I think it's genetic by now. Wow. Mm-hmm, I do. Wow. I, I just don't think they can go anywhere without thinking of taking it from people. Wow. Well, okay. If if you feel at this point it is genetics, the behavior of practicing racism, white supremacy against non-white people, uh, what do you think can be done to uh, combat that? Well, we just have to fight it the same way they fight it uh, on the American continent. You have to make people very aware that you're not going to take it. You're not going to take it sitting down, and you're not going to take it standing up. And I think one of the things about Obama's presidency is precisely a, a, a way of saying, well, move over. This is not the end. It's just the beginning. And I think that, you know, if multiculturalism, although I'm so sick of that term, is being thrown around all the time, then we ought to make it visible. Hmm. And that's what he has done. He has made it visible with his beautiful wife and their two beautiful children. And guess what, all you white supremacists? You're going to have to live with this. <laughs> He's going to run everything. He's going to go over to Afghanistan, try and stop that. He's going to go up to Canada and talk to them. Now, of course, we're all afraid that they will assassinate him. I mean, after all, if they can assassinate Kennedy, if they can assassinate Obama. Hmm. But the fact is that this is a great turning point for people of color. I mean, people in Hawaii were just ecstatic when he was elected. I mean, he grew really? up here. Yeah, he oh, grew that's up here. Yeah, that's right. And that's so right. Um, there are all these people who don't necessarily know him personally, but we were for him, all of us. We were campaigning. I was telling my students to vote for him. Yeah, that's wow. the whole point. Yeah, the whole point is we're sick and tired of white presidents, just like we're sick and tired of white oppression. And so here we have this beautiful man with his beautiful kids and his beautiful wife. And Americans are just going to have to live with it. Wow. I know. Don't you wow. like that? <laughs> it makes me laugh every day. I turn on the TV, and, and you notice how much television coverage he gets. I love it. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. He's just cranking it out. You know, he's going to do this, and he's going to do that. And people tell me, oh, you know, my students, honey, do you really believe that? I said, why not? You know, I mean, my God, he's the president. He's got more power than anybody right now, so let him go and do whatever he wants. No, I just love it. I just think it's, you know, it's what Hawaiians call hoka, which means wop your jaws. We've got a black president, and if you don't like it, just leave America. <laughs> Go and live in Canada. <laughs> I'm glad you think it's funny. Lots of people are well, mad at me for saying that. Oh, I'm <laughs> not mad. No, you sound delighted. <laughs> <laughs> wow, wow. Again, Professor Trask, University of Hawaii. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, I want to check Justice. Uh, did you have some questions that you would like to ask? No, I don't. I think. Oh, oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Oh, um, uh, she said she was good for right now. So please go no, ahead. No, no, no. Let her, let her say whatever she wants to say. You said you, you're good no, for now, Justice. Uh, I don't have any right now, but I might oh, think okay. of some. Okay. okay. 
She's going to think of Give her some time. She will think of something, though. Sure. Uh, please finish your thought, Professor Trask. Well, I just think that more of us should get together around the world, and that's why I keep traveling all over the place, like going to South Africa, because I need to learn from them, and they need to learn from us. And that was a great moment that so many people of color traveled to Africa. I'd never been in Africa in my whole life. And mm. they, most of the people there didn't know, had never heard of Hawaii. I said, well, don't worry about it. It's a little archipelago in the middle of the night. <laughs> but, you know, it was so wonderful to exchange your life experiences with them and uh you know for for them to ask me what what was it like and were we conquered i said oh yeah we're still conquered the united states owns us they said no way over there i said yeah yeah just like the boers came from you know dutch land to go down to to africa so yeah it's colonialism is worldwide and i mean you know then my my favorite metaphor is that the United States goes to the moon and puts the American flag there. So now I guess they think they own the moon. <laughs> you know, the arrogance is unbelievable. They can't I, even I, let the moon alone. <laughs> I agree. I agree. We've had a lot of uh, white people on this program that have experienced a ton of uh, arrogance firsthand uh, on this program. Um, I wanted to, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, I wanted to ask about specifically the uh, the land trust um, mm -hmm. when white people <clears throat> excuse me when white people came to Hawaii and exploited and just snatched everything um, a lot of what they did which which I think is very important and this they've also done with other non-white people is putting land in trusts can you explain what that means and how that has further mistreated uh, yes. Native Hawaiians the, the trust lands are lands that were actually stolen by the settlers, the white settlers, and they turned it into the idea that, no, they would have two entities. One would be Native Hawaiians and one would be the public. And, of course, that never happened. These ceded lands were never ceded. They were stolen. We don't have a single square inch of them, and they are now being filled with all kinds of other entities, buildings, uh, parking places, um, agriculture and none of it not not one half of an inch of it is is set aside for native people so the fact is the ceded lands are a hoax and ceded means granted to you by the people who had it well of course it never happened. they just took it and said these are ours and they still are <laughs> wow mm -hmm. wow it's just such a big lie um i know uh the trust, this was very similar because I, uh, the research that I've done on how uh, Native Americans were mistreated, uh, same thing was done. A lot of lands put in trust and just eventually stolen from them. Yes. Uh, and it was a very uh, paternalistic attitude, like you, uh, you all are too childish and ignorant to know what to do uh, with this land. We'll hold it for you. Did you see similar patterns in what's happened in Hawaii? Yes. They were exactly like that. The idea was, and that's why they call them ceded lands, when in fact they never were ceded. They were stolen, as I said. And now they say that the state is controlling it for us. So some of the Hawaiians very wisely said, you know, some of them are in the legislature. They said, well, now we would like them back. We would like to build houses for Hawaiians. We have the highest homeless rate in Hawaii, which is no surprise. And we would like to put Hawaiians on the land. And then, of course, the government says, well, no, you know, we have to do surveys. We, oh, listen, you've had this for over 100 years, and you're going to tell us that we can't have the land. The fact is you don't want to give it back. And that's why I keep saying when I tell my students about this, it's, it's not the lands were not ceded. That ceded means given. They were not given. They were stolen, and that's what they're called. So, yeah, it's, 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 it's just like American Indians. Wow. Wow. Um, <clears throat> um, one of the things... Um, I thought was, was very important, and this is another, um, it's a consistent pattern and something I really think people should pay attention to. Um, you talked about the <clears throat> prostitution of Hawaiian culture and Hawaiian women and how they have both been uh, just really uh, horribly abused. Uh, could, you, could you share some of that for our listeners? Sure. For people who think that the term um, only applies to rape victims need to look at it in terms of cultural rape and that's what's happened to to us is that we have become so commodified as an entity beautiful dark-skinned friendly also stupid people but they're so kind and so soft and that is what drives 
the tourist commodity. The tourists come here because they've bought and because the the, the local uh, groups here have said for at least since the beginning of the 20th century that this is paradise and that if you come here, you will be happy, you'll meet beautiful people, you can have sex because it's free everywhere, and the Hawaiians are so pleasant and accommodating. And that's a total caricature of who we are. But the, the virtue of it is that it generates enormous a number of, uh, a number of tourists. So six and a half million tourists is just unbelievable. We have just a little over of one million people as who lives here in the archipelago. To have six million tourists gives you a sense of how inundated we are. And then, of course, when times are bad, like they are now, and the economy is tanking, then tourism sort of shrivels because people don't want to pay to fly all the way over from you know the continent to the archipelago. And the the response by the the city and county of Honolulu and the state of Hawaii is panic because that's what they've put all their eggs in the basket for. And of course, I'm very happy about it. No <laughs> tourists would come here. We hate wow. them. Yeah, and I've said that so many times. I've said it publicly. I've said it, um, you know, on various shows, saying, "No, we don't want." And they, people would say, "You are shocking. We've never met anybody like you." I said, "You don't know anything about Hawaii. You all assume that the propaganda is accurate. It's not. We never wanted you to come here. Never. Who would?" We need six and a half million outsiders, like, you know, we need flu. <laughs> wow. <laughs> They're a disease. That's how I always <laughs> talk about them. I always talk about tourism as a form of disease. It's parasitic. Wow. <laughs> wow. Uh, again, Professor Trask, University of Hawaii. Um, as I said, I have been, I was one of those. I have been to Hawaii. I did not feel, um, I didn't feel that I was mistreated by Native mm-hmm. Hawaiians while I was there. I, in fact, I felt they were very nice to me um, while I was there. But I did see a lot of uh, anger about mm-hmm. white people, uh, mm-hmm. white tourists and white people who just live there. Live here, um, yep. I saw a lot of that, and I, I do think that's an important distinction to make because I, I, did not, I did not get the sense that if a black person came to Hawaii, they would be treated the same way as a white person coming to yep. Hawaii. Do you no. think that's true? Nobody is treated, nobody is disliked as much as Howleys, that's what we call white people. Mm. And the reason is because they're the ones overthrew the government, banned the language, divided us by blood quantum. And they are the most arrogant people, which is nothing new to people like yourself, <laughs> they are the most arrogant people we've ever met. I mean, they refuse to pronounce our names correctly. They refuse to, I, mean, I, I never go to Waikiki because, because these tourists literally pick up my hair, ask me like this, do you speak English? Speak English. <laughs> you know, they, who is the stupid, ignorant country here? And that's part of the whole romance of, of being a tourist is that we're here to entertain you. Well, once we started the sovereignty movement, you know, people stayed 4,000. I never go to Waikiki. I don't want to because I can't stand them. So, And most of my, my students are the same way, and most Hawaiians are the same way. Unless you have to work there for a living, nobody wants to go to Waikiki. There's no reason to. My whole family moved to other islands because they can't stand the whole island of Oahu. I'm just here because I have a job. Otherwise, I'd be up there with them. <laughs> wow. Wow. Um, I actually I knew uh, the term... Uh, Howley, uh, mm-hmm. I was there for I was there for a couple of months. I wasn't there there for a couple of days, um, and uh, they said it's something that's blown in on the wind. Is that correct? No, Howley means foreign. And uh, the, when the tourists sometimes get angry and say we made it up about them, I say no, that's your arrogance as usual. The word <laughs> Howley existed before tourists got here, when there were only Hawaiians, and it just means foreign. So the birds, for example. My mother's a native speaker. The birds that that were here that were introduced are called howly birds because they they didn't exist naturally. Okay. Yeah. Howlies keep thinking it has to do with color. I said no, you just happen to be the first white people here. But if anybody <laughs> else had come, they'd also howly just means foreign. It just means foreign birds, foreign plants, etc. So. Okay. But you know, howlies, they always want to be number one in the hatred. <laughs> I think it's fine. Go ahead, like stupid people you are, and think that, but it's incorrect. I got you. I got you. Um, 
one of the uh, one of the things that I noted um, in moving around, uh, if you're if you're downtown Hawaii, uh, mm -hmm. it looks it looks like any other big city that you would yes. go to. It you know you you wouldn't even know you're in Hawaii if somebody That's didn't right. tell you. If you move, um, I spent a lot of time near uh, Haleiwa and. Um, I jumped off the rocks at Waimea Bay. If you move mm -hmm. there, that's now it starts to look like you know what you would think of when you think about Hawaii. Yes. And oh. I saw a lot. I think there are a lot more Native Hawaiians there. Is that correct? Well, there used to be. They're diminishing now because those places have become very um, public and popular. Mm. So the island of Oahu, for example, my entire family has moved to the Big Island. And, which is called Hawaii Island, because they can't stand living here. Because there's so many tourists, and it's so crowded and so expensive, the whole family just took off. The only reason I'm here is because I'm a professor. We only have one university, and it happens to be right here in Honolulu. So that's part of the problem. Um, but it is. I mean, it, it's, we are going to be like most native colonized people. We're going to be pushed out. Right now, the estimate is that there are more Hawaiians living on the continent than live here. Wow. And that, yeah, and that has to do, entire diaspora is always uh, the result of being taken over by somebody else. So that if one entity takes over somebody's country, soon enough they start leaving and they change everything. They, our language was banned for almost 100 years. We were divided by blood quantum like American Indians. It's always the same. And the, whole, the hope of the colonizer, to me, is to get rid of the colonized. Just get rid of them. And then they can have it for themselves. And surely enough, now we have less Hawaiians living here than live in California. Wow. I know. Isn't that terrible? It's really, I, really terrible. Man, one, one, of the, uh, one of the additional um, just really ugly forms of, of racism that I observed while I was in Hawaii, um, Hawaii has some of the just incredible beaches. Um, mm -hmm. I, I know I was, I was fortunate to see uh, quite a few while I was there, um, but... The Native Hawaiians, uh, they were saying that a lot of uh, Haoli's white people uh, were coming in and were buying uh, property, uh, either beach property or property that's pretty close to the water, mm -hmm. and they were making the beach private. So yes. all these Which areas is that state law, right? Mm, yeah, uh, the and, state and of Hawaii says that the public has access to all beaches up until the high point of the waves, and what they have done, what Hollies have done now, is to close off the access roads so that you can get down to the beach. And when I was living in Waimanalo, which is on the other side of Oahu from where I live now, because now I live in the city, um, we started a big fight about it. And so we tore down all their stuff. And it, it was very good, because we won. We won. And the, the, the press was there, and the governor intervened, and we said, listen, the state of Hawaii says that all people can have access to uh, the beaches up to the high water point. And what you, you folks, you rich white people have done, is block off the entrance so we can't even get in there. So they lost. They, they came, the, the state came and dug out all their, their, their fences and said, you can't do this. This is against state law. But it just gives you a sense of, of the kind of people they are. They just are, they, they have no manners. They don't ex uh, admit that they're living in somebody else's country. It's just, it's appalling, really. Wow. Wow. Yeah, I, I observed a ton of that. Uh, and and I, when I spoke with a lot of the uh, Native Hawaiians, uh, obviously me being a black person, they assumed that I could relate to having yes. frustrations with yes. white people mistreating me. Um, and we spent a lot of time um, just talking Rapid about, about that. Yep. Yep. Yeah, and, and they shared just a ton of uh, just really interesting stories, and, and they uh, were trying to explain why certain things looked the way it did, like why you saw – uh, so many homeless people on the beach yes. in Hawaii, and how that came about. Could you yes. could you share some of that with our audience? Yes, it's it's of massive proportions right now, and of course it has everything to do with the economy, because Hawaii is so expensive, and uh, of course as homeless people stay longer and longer on the beach, they really do go go off because they're living terrible lives, and the, the, instead of the city and county, at least here on Oahu. The, they're not doing anything about it. Their idea is to just kick people off the beach. Well, that's not going to help anything. So some of the entities who are 
run by people who care about such things. They're opening up soup kitchens. And, and that's the story I wish people would print on the continent. Come to Hawaii and see homeless people. <laughs> Come to Hawaii and see soup kitchens. It's just what you got from the news, you know. This is such lies. Everything about Hawaii is a lie because they do it for the, for the presence of tourists. And that's, that's where we are. Wow, I I don't think most people, I don't even think most people would see that no. unless they got away from downtown Hawaii, unless yeah. you moved to different areas and really ran into just regular Native Hawaiians and mm-hmm. talked to them for a little bit. I don't even think you would see that. You would just see the regular uh, big, huge hotels and you know all the ra- all the same silly stuff you would see if you were in downtown L.A. Yes. or downtown San yes. Francisco. Yeah. And that's why um, we always tell people, don't go over to the windward side on, on Oahu. <laughs> like this because one side is all the tourism. We tell them, don't go over there. You know, did you know that people still eat other people? Yes, it's true. I don't, but of course, it's, you know, you just make up all this stuff so they don't go down where we are. <laughs> and they're so stupid, they believe it. <laughs> so, you know, and, and uh, you know, my, my brother tells people about sharks. He, he, he's a, a fisherman. And he tells people, oh, yes, you know, it's not true that sharks just, just go into deep waters. Oh, no, they come right up to the sand. Which of course is <laughs> sharks aren't interested in the sand. <laughs> but, you know, you've got to do something to protect yourself. <laughs> wow. Yeah. Wow. Again, again, Professor Trask, University of Hawaii. Um, wow, I, I, uh, I, there, I, there's, you had several anecdotes. I want to make sure I don't, uh, I don't miss them uh, in the book. Um, but other things that I observed while I was in Hawaii, um, I think Pearl Harbor is still, that's like one of the major attractions, getting people to go and yes. see all the yep. um, craziness that, that happened from there. Do they actually, uh, do they talk about uh, Dole and their role in, Taking over uh, Dole the Pineapple Company, that's mm-hmm. what I'm alluding to, uh, did they talk at all about their role in taking over and snatching native lands and the abuse that uh, oh, went down no. in their name? No, okay. we're the only people that talk about it. Hawaiians okay. are forever talking about, you know, the howlers, as they're called. And they came in, it was a whole group of them. They, they overthrew the government, and they put the queen in prison, and they proceeded to take all the lands. And they're descended from those people. The Dole okay. people are descended from the, the from those people, and it, it it goes on and on. You know, it, we we still have people who are direct descendants of the missionaries who are filing lawsuits against Native Hawaiians, and this wow. is we're talking about a hundred and something years already, and they can't get over their racism, they can't get over their hatred when they already own Hawaii and they're already millionaires. Wow. I know such kinds of people, and they think we're primitive. Huh? <laughs> it's the opposite. The primitives are them, the Americans. They're, you know, and I'm, I'm always telling people, you know, you're so arrogant. Do you know that we're 2,000 years old? How old is the United States? And they say, what's that got to do with it? I said, that would explain why you're so crude. You need at least another thousand years before you come to humanity. They don't have any idea of how they behave. You know, they mispronounce our words, and we tell them, no, that's not how you pronounce it. If you can't pronounce it, don't say it. It's just, it, it's... It's like living in a zoo, and you're the people behind the bars, and the ones that are throwing food at you and trying to make faces. That's what tourists are like. Wow. Yeah, it's awful. Wow. Yeah, I never go to Waikiki. And if I have to go to give a speech or something, I go to the very far end where the park is, because that's where all of our people go and play you know, games and stuff. So I, I don't want to have anything to do with the tourists, because you know they, they do the most outrageous things. I, I, I think Americans are the most un... I don't know what it is. I don't know what the name is. They, they just don't have any manners. The idea of picking up my hair used to drive me crazy. I have never done that in my life or ever thought about it. You know, that's like me meeting you and poking your face and saying, can you speak English? I know, it's just, they're, they're shockingly undeveloped. Wow. I know, it's terrible. It is, and, and it, it's also partly because they're so excited about coming to what I call Bonga Bonga Land. You know, it's 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 the romance of it makes them act very peculiar. I'm sure they don't uh-huh. pick up people's hair when they're on their home turf. <laughs> they do it here. Yeah. You, <laughs> you, I used to say to people, you know, Americans are the dumbest people in the world. And they'd say, 
Why do you say that? That's really cruel. You should be lucky to be an American. I said, oh, no, let's not go through this. <laughs> God, why do Americans think that? Like, like everybody else shouldn't have their own country? God, wow. I know, it's terrible. Yeah. It? You, you think part of, uh, I guess, the way that uh, the propaganda and the way that Hawaii is uh, romanticized worldwide, you think that plays into uh, white people coming there and, and yeah. just being really arrogant and just uh, – Having a really condescending attitude towards the, yes. the native. Okay. Okay. Yes. That, and it's true in their stupid programs um, that they used to have uh, X years ago, made in Hollywood, but, you know, it was about Hawaii and all these falsifications of beautiful Hawaiian women just waiting to jump in there with you. And, yeah, all of that is, is the propaganda to get more tourists here and has been mm. since the territory. So uh, nobody knows on the continent what real Hawaiians are like. They wouldn't know one if they saw one. They don't know anything about the language, about, you know, how Hawaii – they don't even know how Hawaii became part of the United States, which I find just shockingly stupid that Americans don't know that. I mean, if you look at a map, you say, well, now how is it that here's California and 2,400 miles out to sea is another state? It's down to them that somebody stole it. Okay? It's like looking at Tahiti and saying, how come this says FR for France, which is you know even more further away than we are from the United States. They don't think of colonialism as a bad thing. They think of it as a gift that they gave us. Mm. That uh, that is one of the big things that stuck out to me, particularly as I said, as I as I moved away from like downtown Waikiki mm -hmm. and um, just stayed over more in Haleiwa and, and mm -hmm. kind of in, was on that end of the island. That um, it really set in that you know this does not look anything like what the continental U.S. is. It is mind-boggling to think. This is also a part of the so-called United States. I mean, yes. you feel like you're in another country. Yes. Um, just, uh, I mean, just Shocking. everything. <laughs> yes. Uh, yes. I mean, wow. And I don't even think most uh, most uh, American citizens that go there, I don't think they, uh, just as you said, I don't think they have any understanding or even think while they're there, exactly how did this place yes. um, become yes. uh, a part of the U.S.? How is it that I can come here, I don't need a passport, and just, Hang out, do whatever. I could move here if I wanted to, and it, you know, <laughs> wouldn't be anything. And uh, and then that's a very good point because the diaspora of Hawaiians is is now past the point. There are more Hawaiians in California than there are here, and that's mm -hmm. because of the economy, because tourism made things so expensive. And that's true for the poor Tahitians; they were taken over by the French. That's true for New Zealand, which was taken over by the British. Mm. You know, the archipelagos are are first on the agenda because it's the Europeans who came to to capitalism first. Mm. And I remember people telling me, you know, Hanani, that's part of the reason that Hawaiians are underdeveloped. I said, no, you are underdeveloped. Capitalism is a crime. I suggest you read Marx. We didn't have capitalism. We shared all that we had, food, the land, everything else. Now they they look at that as great, you know. I'm rich and you're poor. Isn't that wonderful? <laughs> These people are sick. <laughs> what can I say? Gosh. Wow. Uh, I wanna I wanna double check my co-host see if she uh, has some uh, questions she would like to ask. Um, Justice, do you have some questions you want to ask? What do you What do you know about racism and white supremacy? About racism and white supremacy? Gosh, I know more than I wish I ever had. Um, racism starts with the idea that some people are superior be by virtue of their race and other people are inferior because of virtue by their race. And the fact is that we are all human beings and that's how we should be called, human beings, and not people who are lesser or greater. And what was the other one you asked? Race and what was the second question you had? Well, my question was, what do you know about racism and white supremacy? Okay. A great deal, unfortunately. Uh, the University of Hawaii is the largest uh, university in the state of Hawaii, and uh, their faculty was overwhelmingly white and their student body was overwhelming, overwhelmingly people of color, that is to say local people from Hawaii. 
And when we wanted to start the Center for Hawaiian Studies, we were told by the university that Hawaiians are not interested in education, so you don't really need a Center for Hawaiian Studies. This is after they had centers for Japanese studies, Korean studies, American studies. And we just said, no, we're going to fight you. We're going to fight you every step of the way. We want a place on the University of Hawaii. It's the only university in the state of Hawaii. And so we got it, but it took years and years and years to get it. So that's a perfect example of their racism. Okay, that'll be all for now. Groovy. Um, since you uh, you brought up, <coughs> excuse me, the University of Hawaii, um, you had an, just an incredible uh, story in your book uh, from a native daughter. Uh, where you talked about uh, your experience with, uh, I guess, one of your colleagues, Mr. Joey Carter. Um, could you could you share that anecdote with our listeners, please? Well, I have to recall it. I haven't thought about it for a while, but he he was a racist, and uh, we demonstrated against him. That is my faculty and my students, and he proceeded to then if I can remember correctly, start saying that he was being abused by us. And so therefore, not only did we do a march and make the news, but I said, I want to debate with you. If you think that we're the ones that caused the problem here instead of you white people, then let's have a debate. And of course, he didn't want to have a debate. So the university created another debate, and that was between myself and the, um, I'm trying to remember the, the department. It was something like... Um, I can't remember right now, something something in the sciences, and they wanted to come forward. Oh, no, I know what it was. It was anthropology. The anthropology department said they wanted to debate with Trask because she is a racist. So I said, bring them on. You know, you never, you never debate with anybody in my family. We're, we're famous in four generations so far for being incredible talkers, and we're, and we're so, you know, we, we can't stand these people. We want to get out of our country. So they, we had this public forum. It was filmed and everything. And this guy got up there and started talking in this kind of whiny voice about, you know, this is a racist place. And when he was all done, he said, okay, Professor Trask, it's your turn. I said, well, let me just ask you a question. If you think all of this is true, then why do you live here? We never asked you to come here. In fact, the only reason you're here is because the United States overthrew our government and made us part of the United States. So please be my guest and leave. And the audience just burst out <laughs> laughing. And he, you know, that was, I hate to say it, that was the beginning of the end. He got his butt kicked in by me, by the audience. People started to boo him. And I thought, yeah, what do you think? You think you can come all the way to my country and say that you belong here? You don't belong here. You don't even belong in the United States. You belong in Europe. At least we know where we came from. He doesn't, you know. So, anyway, does that help? <laughs> I enjoy oh. your laughter. I really do. <laughs> they, uh... I, I'm, I'm laughing, but this is, I, I think a lot of people, if they're listening to this program, they can relate, <clears throat> yeah. because I can relate to having uh, white people. And you said this guy's a racist. Yeah. Um, but not the guy you debated, the, uh, Joey, Joey Clark, yeah. Uh, yeah. Carter, excuse me. Yeah. Um, yeah. That they, when you just begin to speak honestly about racism, white supremacy, and how you've been mistreated as a non-white person, mm -hmm. they will say, hey, you're being racist. Yes, you right. you are you you are in, encouraging and inciting violence and mistreatment of white people. And that's like, well, well, wait a minute, wait a minute. Talk about uh, turning it around, you know? Yeah, no, it's 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 you know it's what's commonly called BS. You know, you just like, oh my poor, I'm just a poor white person. Well, then go back with white persons. You know, we didn't ask you to come over here. No, it's it's that that whole American. You know, we're suffering. Well. Do something about it. I, my favorite slogan, you're going to love this, was 10 flights a day, Amer United Airlines, take one and get out. You know. <laughs> the, the press would call me up and say, oh, then, do you have a statement? I said, I gave you one last year. They said, no, come on, you've got to give us a series one. I said, it is serious. <laughs> you think I want them to stay here? Forget it. <sighs> wow. I mean, the people that got great politics, they can stay, but you're not in great politics, leave. No, it is. It's just terrible. It's, it's the whole... The whole commodification of Hawaii is some beautiful woman and everybody will have their you know, their desires satiated by us. Oh please, you know. 
we've got so many problems, and so many military bases, and too damn many tourists, and you just start talking to me like I like I deserve, you deserve for me to give you an answer. Wow! You would have, surely it's nice talking to you. <laughs> you're, Likewise. You're, oh, you're so funny. Likewise, it is. Uh, I don't. I don't think anybody, if they've uh, listened to this program, I think I, I, this is easily the program I've had the most giggles uh, of any oh, guest that I've talked to, uh, and it has been incredibly uh, helpful information. Um, I wanted to I, I also, because I read from your book, I wanted to make sure I shared the stat uh, about the statistics so that people can really grasp this in their mind. I believe you said, and it might be worse now, but you said uh, that it, the tourists outnumbered. Native Hawaiians, thirty to one. Is that That's correct? correct? That's okay. correct. And and although the the tourism, um, the, the actual numbers are going down, it's because of the economy. As soon as the economy comes back, there'll be more again. But mm. in the meantime, Hawaiians are still out migrating to the continent, especially to California, because they can't afford to live here. But that mm. is accurate. That is an accurate one. I'm one of the few people that's ever used that as a bad thing. I get attacked all the time in the newspaper because they say, well, if Trask doesn't like Hawaii, why doesn't she leave? And I just love it because <laughs> it's so stupid. They never think of who I am. So then I write back and I say, it's unfortunate that some people never quite know the difference between being a person and being a native person. And mm. I happen to be native, so I belong here. And you, Mr. Writer, are not native, so why don't you leave? Yeah, it, it is that classic, you know, if you don't believe what we believe as Americans, you've got to get out of your own country. No. <laughs> no, that's not true. So here I am still doing things like what I'm doing right now, talking to you, and thanks for this. This is, You're making me laugh myself. This is great. Groovy. Um, <laughs> um, wow. I, uh, I also, I'm... I'm think because you had such a great, I'm all, I guess I'm hoping I'm plugging the book and telling people enough uh, cool stories so that they will be motivated to read the book uh, and check out the film, uh, Act of War, uh, yep. both of them. Yep. Check it out. Excellent information. Um, I also wanted to share, um, going back to the military base, because that was really stunning even before I read your book, just being there and just, like I said, seeing these huge trucks drive by every day. Um, you talked a lot about the uh, waste, nuclear waste, uh, and nuclear products uh, that are in Hawaii and just huge problem. Can you can you share some of that information with our listeners? Yes, because of the size of the military presence, there is a great deal of dangerous material, all kinds of it. And for example, their training areas are filled with bombs and explosives. And they have several training areas uh, on the Big Island of Hawaii, on Oahu, which has the most military bases. And these are all toxic. The, the military has never disclosed whether or not they are taking care of that problem. And we are not allowed to get any answer from them because they don't have to reply. So several years ago, people went in and just you know, did a sit-down and say, we want to be arrested because we want you to tell us what you've got in here. And the military's position is we don't tell anybody anything. These are military installations, and we don't need to disclose it to the common public. And so they never have. But, of course, we know that if you have a range where they're firing all the time, like they do in a place called um, Waimanalo, then we know that it's there. Or Waianae. Waianae is even better because they're at the, the, the end of the, and one of the poorest areas for Hawaiians. And that's where they do testing. They bomb the islands. They bomb the, the, the mountains. They bomb uh, the areas where the sands are. And how can you not, I mean, you can't hide that from a people. You can hear it and you can see it. Mm. So that's, that's the whole problem with being, although tourism is really bad, the fact is that tourists don't have bullets and guns and any number of other things, trucks. But the military is, is the one. And they are, in, when I write stuff, I always talk about them as the worst. You are the worst entity in Hawaii because they're poisonous. Everything they do causes poisonous, you know, deep well stuff going all the way down to the bottom and uh, the the fishing areas that once you explode a bomb, animals go crazy. And all that stuff is, is still going on. And it's almost never written about. Oh, okay. Wow. I'm 
want to double check uh, with my co-host. See if she, oh, she does have some questions. Go right ahead, Justice. I do not have any questions uh, yet. Oh, okay. Mm-hmm. I no, miscalculated. I okay. Um, you uh, you already touched on this to uh, some degree, but I, I want to make sure our listeners do not miss this. Um, in your book and when I was there, a lot of Native Hawaiians, they talked about <clears throat> how they uh, their grandparents uh, and, and just many generations down the line had lived in, in certain areas. Uh, in some cases, they lived on the beach, uh, just, you know, incredibly gorgeous areas, but they could not afford to live there anymore, that they were literally being outpriced uh, of their native land by, in some cases, uh, Sylvester Stallone and other white people uh, who have a lot of money who can just come in and say, well, uh, this." and you said, I believe, the, the average price uh, for a home in Hawaii was $350,000. Yes, uh, and that's in the city and in Honolulu, on the neighbor islands, it's cheaper except for Kauai, but it depends, you know, again, as you say, it depends on the kind of place that it is. There are some very special places. Now they call them gated communities to keep dark people like me out. And the whole purpose of, yeah, it is, it really is, because they're all white enclaves. And I thought, I don't know what the hell's wrong with these people. Why would you come all the way over to Kauai to live here and then not want any dark people around you? Then don't come here. No, it's the same problem. You know, they, it's it's those enclaves. They love the beauty. They love the climate, but they can't stand seeing dark people everywhere. It's just, it, I mean, if I hated dark people that much, I wouldn't go near them. But they're just the opposite, you know. So I don't know. It's it's counterintuitive. But there are lots of places like that, you know, and they're becoming very, very not only expensive, um, but it, you wouldn't want to live there anyway because of the people who do. That's why my whole family, with the, with my own exception, lives on the Big Island, and they live in Hilo. Hilo is wet and rainy, and the Kona side is where all the rich people live, and it's dry, and they live on the wet side because they don't want to be next to the tourists. And the only reason I'm still here is because I teach at the university, so I have to be here to come and teach. So I live on Oahu, but I would much rather move to the Big Island. Wow. Wow. Um, I'm not sure if uh, if you are informed about this, but I did want to check because this is something that I saw firsthand and was informed about. Um, when I was there, um, crystal meth was a huge, huge problem um, that a lot of people were talking about. Um, have you have you observed that the impact that that's had on Native Hawaiians? Have you do you have any information on that? I haven't, and part of it I think is because I'm te- I'm a teacher. But I do know from friends who live in very poor Hawaiian districts that that is the case. I have never seen it myself, but I've never actually gone out to those places. But it doesn't surprise me at all because oppressed people tend to turn to things like that. In fact, when when my students had asked me about it, I'd never heard about it. I I never heard the name. Oh, okay. Yeah, and then they started to explain it explain it to me that they had friends who were addicted, and I'd never even heard about it. But then, huh. you know, I'm 60 years old. Why would I hear about <laughs> the people I hang out with are, are trying to give up smoking? You know, I'm a <laughs> They don't want to know crystal meth any more than I would. But I do I do have heard from people that, that, that it is, you know, it is a problem in Hawaii. Okay, okay. Um, I... I enjoy doing my research. I was not able to get my hands on uh, Act of War before the program. Could you could you share uh, more information about what that film is about so that we can make yeah. it to track it down? Act of War is the statement that was made by uh, some Americans who were opposed to the takeover of Hawaii, and they called it, in fact, in the um, in the I think it was a two volume study that was commissioned by one of the presidents very early on to go down to Hawaii and see what had happened. And in that, I can't remember the name of the, of the man who, who, the, who the study is named after. Um, he decided that, in fact, this and this 100 years later is where the apology came from, that this entire thing was a subterfuge, that there were no Americans that were uh, – um, in harm's way, and that this was entirely made up to protect uh, the Howleys, the white 
landowners here so that they could control Hawaii, which of course is exactly what happened. And that finally came out as, you know, now lots of people have done films about it and all kinds of stuff, that in fact the United States made an apology that admitted that they had invaded our country and banned our language and put our, our queen, who was the, the reigning entity at the time, in prison and just took it over and occupied it. And when I was asked that during the centenary of the overthrow, uh, which was several years ago, when I was asked my opinion, my opinion was, no, we're still, you know, we're still occupied. Nothing's changed. I mean, they came in, they took the country, and... Um, declared martial law and put an all-white government in its place. Well, that's what America does. They do it everywhere. So we're still, as far as I'm concerned, in captivity. Wow. And for, in, in your book, uh, I thought this was, was great, that when an apology was issued um, mm-hmm. for the abuse that Hawaiian, Native Hawaiians uh, suffered, um, however, you said, uh, we're not looking for just, you know, we're sorry. Our, our fault, uh, mea culpa, we're looking for repair for the damage that has been done, uh, restitution. Uh, is that correct? Yes. And okay. I had asked, well, there was a big thing that went on for several years about what exactly do Hawaiians want, and I said it about 8 million times. You took 2 million acres of our land. We never ceded them. You stole them. Give them back. That's the answer. The big problem for Hawaiians, why there's a diaspora to the continent, no land. And, of course, if you want to buy something in Hawaii, you're crazy. It's in the millions. Mm, yeah. yeah, and that's what they did. They upped everything because now it's, it's you know, it's very fancy places where rich people come two weeks a year. Mm. I just I want to make sure I did not misread. You, you were also very clear in saying that um, you did not want uh, financial compensation. You did not want money. You wanted the actual land that yes. was taken to re- be returned. Could you yes. explain why you did not want financial compensation? You specifically want the land to be returned. To Hawaiians, the land is called our mother, and mm. that's how we think of Hawaii. This is where we would, were displaced, and this is what we want back. We don't want you to give us an apology. We don't want the money. Money is mm. ephemeral, and it's not Hawaiian. What we want is the land that you took, where our elders are buried, where we did um, worship for our gods. That's what makes a people a people, as opposed to money. Anybody can get money. Not anybody can be Hawaiian. Mm. Outstanding. I want to want to double check, uh, make sure uh, Justice, if you're there, if you have any questions you would like to ask. I don't. I don't, okay. but I will think of some. Oh, okay. Groovy. I want to, uh, if we uh, if we have Internet access, I'd love to see if we can take a, uh... okay. Are we, uh, would you be willing to take some questions if we have Internet access from folks? Sure. Uh, who call? Okay. Yeah. yeah. I would like to get some questions in uh, mm-hmm. from folks. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah, in, in uh, the meantime, I did want to check when I was there, um, I, I mentioned Sylvester Stallone specifically because Native Hawaiians, they informed me that he was uh, trying to buy property. Um, yeah. I don't remember the specific island, but he was trying to buy property. And Native Hawaiians, somehow they were able to stop him from doing this. I think they had, uh, they, I don't remember the name, but they had some sort of um, commission of some sort that could make decisions about who was able to uh, purchase land. And they did not give him authority to purchase that land. Do you know about uh, Native Hawaiian groups having uh, some sort of authority to, authority to govern who can and who cannot purchase uh, land in Hawaii? It depends on the kind of land it is because there are the ceded lands which were taken from Hawaiians and now have a special access for Native Hawaiians as compensation. So it may have been that he wanted ceded lands. Then there are lands that are protected for their uniqueness. <laughs> So that could be part of it, that he, or was part of it. I didn't follow that case, although I had heard about it, that he wanted to do something that was forbidden. And what the nature of that was, I don't know. But I do know that that, this is very common. There are so many Hollywood people in Hawaii. And they don't live here a full year, but they expect treatment as though they're still on the continent. They don't mean anything to us. 
So they, they think that they're important, that they got millions of dollars, and who cares? And the state, I, I, this is my recollection of it, but it could be wrong. It was a while ago. The state just said, this is illegal. You cannot do this. We don't care what your name is. And I think that was the problem. You know, the problem was that he didn't want to follow the rules, which is, you know, par for the course with arrogant, you know. <laughs> you should stick to being a bad actor instead of being a bad human being. You know? <laughs> Yeah, I, I, I mean, I, I really enjoyed, thoroughly enjoyed. I know there were tons of white people when I heard that story, when I was talking to Native Hawaiians there, and they would talk to me about the white people. I guess Hawaii, I don't surf, but I've been told Hawaii is an incredible surf spot, and uh, white people from all over the world would uh, just fly to Hawaii, and they would get mad, and they would say, yeah. you know, the, the, uh, the natives, uh, they're not nice to us. They, you know, they're blocking us from surfing, and yeah. I don't understand. And I would yeah. just crack up laughing. Yeah. And, uh, <laughs> this, that's the, you know, that, thank you for that because I've, you know, I've traveled all. No, I wouldn't say all over the world, but many, many places. And lots of indigenous people feel this way. I went to Basque country and met the Basques. They are wonderful. They said the same thing. You know, I went to Canada. You got all these Indian tribes up there, and they keep saying. What is the matter with white people? Do they have to go to every single enclave? I said, no, they do. It has nothing to do with the place, the beauty, the people. It has to do with arrogance. They think they belong everywhere. The fact is, they are the youngest people on earth, and black people are the original people. And they, and they don't even think of that. You know, us darkies, we're, you know, we're just, <laughs> we're hopeless, you know. All the people of color on earth came before white people. For good reason, too. If you were God, would you really do that? Oh, man. It just drives me crazy. Come on. They're, they're insane. They think they're good looking? I don't think so. Neither do most of the rest of the world. Oh. I love your laughter. Um, I, I'm... The I hope people do not uh, mistake my laughter for uh, missing this incredibly instructive, constructive information. Uh, very no, we're having a good time. That's what it for is. Sure, for sure, for <laughs> sure. Um, I, I, I didn't want to miss this because actually a white person did bring this up on the program uh, a few weeks ago. Uh, her name is uh, Ariella Gross. She's a professor at the University of Southern California, and she talked about Explicitly, she talked about racism and white supremacy, and in her book, she talked about <clears throat> how uh, Native Hawaiians, another way that they have been mistreated is in who actually gets to be classified as a Native Hawaiian and how yeah. white people have consistently manipulated that yeah. to the advantage of white people and to yeah. the exclusion of Native Hawaiians. Can you... Can you share that with us so we get a yeah, clear picture of that? they divided us by blood quantum the same way they did with the American Indians. And if you are 50% Hawaiian, you must show it, either by a birth certificate, which is ridiculous. I mean, nobody goes walking around saying, I'm half of this. Mm. You're either a human person or you're not. But, of course, you know, this is whole set up so that if you can't prove it, then you don't have access to what are called the Hawaiian homelands. Mm. And that's why they made up the idea. Most Hawaiians could never prove what they are because we don't, we just consider ourselves Hawaiian. Now, some of us know our genealogy, so, you know, you might have somebody who's Chinese or Japanese or Korean or Haole, or, but we don't go around divvying it up by entities, by saying you're 25%, you're 50%. Well, the state of Hawaii did that, and they said that Hawaiian homelands can only go to 50 percenters. But if your, your birth certificate doesn't say what percenter you are, then you're not eligible. So obviously they did it on purpose. It's to cut out all the people. What they should have said is, if you're Hawaiian, you're eligible, but they won't do that. So that's the big problem. The other problem is the state controls the Hawaiian homelands, and so they have a great many Hawaiian homelands that are used for state business, that they don't have any Hawaiians on it. And there have been lawsuits against the state for doing that, saying this is not why it was set up in the territory, you're misusing what the purpose was, and they admit it. They say, yes, we are, but, you know, that's too bad. We need the land. So, wow. It's, you know, it's like Indian reservations. That's really mm. what I can think of, that here's all this land now that we probably killed all of you and drove you off your, your regular land. Here's these five acres of land, but you can't mm. have any of it. That's, that's pretty much our situation. 
Wow. If it was if it was up to you and you could decide who's going to be classified as Native Hawaiian and on what basis, what would you do? I would say that whoever is Hawaiian and can prove it by genealogy, which is how Hawaiians prove who they are, uh, then they should be entered in that capacity to have some con- compensation from what happened to us. And I would never go by blood quantum because blood quantum is not something Hawaiians invented. If you are Hawaiian, you trace it by your past, who was your parents, your grandparents, your great-grandparents. That's how Hawaiians always did it, did it even before the Howleys got here. That's how you do it. It's called genealogy. And the Americans said, no, you have to prove you're 50% or more. Nobody, nobody walks around saying, hi, I'm a 50%er. That's retarded. So that's, that's part of the problem. The other part of the problem is the program is run by the state, which is you know, just a, a grouping of crooks. Mm. Wow. Again, Professor Trask, University of Hawaii, um, and yes, I have thoroughly enjoyed the program. Thank um, you. <laughs> I want to, uh, I want to double check, uh, Justice. Uh, did you have any any question? How do white people practice racism white supremacy? I can't hear you. Could you say it again? How do white people practice racism white supremacy? How do how do white people do what? How do white people practice racism and white supremacy? Racism is very easy for white people because they think of themselves as being superior to begin with. So everybody is from that point on, you know, either in the middle, at the end, or at the very bottom. And that works in Hawaii despite all the propaganda about how wonderful Hawaii is. The reality is that there is a declension of who is first, who is second, who is third. The Hollies are first, the white people. The second are now the Japanese, although they, they weren't before. Um, and then there are people who are technically white, but the white people don't consider them white like the Portuguese. And then there are uh, Chinese and uh, Koreans. And then at the very bottom are my people, the Native Hawaiians. And that's the way it's gone for, you know, since the first date of the overthrow. Can I Again, um, I don't think you heard this, Professor Trask, but um, before um, before you were on the air, I was letting everybody know that we're on uh, location, Justice and myself, for this program. We uh, I normally would be uh, in front of a computer directly so that I could uh, get people and, and bring them on to ask questions, but I am not for this program, uh, and I'm struggling to get online to get uh, people for questions, so it's looking like I cannot get callers so that we can uh, – get their questions through to you. I'm a little disappointed about that because I'm sure people uh, have been uh, curious to ask you direct mm-hmm. questions about, you know, your experience, perhaps. And, it's, and especially since the propaganda of Hawaii doesn't fit what I'm saying. Ex- I always exactly. laugh about that. I always do. People are so shocked. Sometimes they'll say, you are a terrible person. I say, you? <laughs> have you ever met me? No. You just don't like what I'm saying. Well, I'm glad, mm. though, that you're saying this because I have a, a, a meeting in about 20 minutes. So I'm glad you called, you know, now. Oh, me too. Me too. Yeah. I'm, I'm thrilled. Um, perhaps, since I'm struggling with the Internet, we can get you on another program, and that way we'll have time to uh, get people so that they can ask questions and call in and, and speak to you fun. directly. Yeah, uh, that'd be real fun. We will have to work on this. I will get another call um, so that, yeah, we can get Professor Trask back on the program. So I'll make this up to our listeners and Professor Trask. Um, so, yeah, that will look for that in the future. We'll have Professor Trask back so you all can get your calls in. Um, thank you a ton for uh, taking time out of your schedule to uh, speak with us and share information. If there's anything you'd like to say to uh, close us out, please feel free. Well, thank you. I think it's always wonderful when anybody cares about what real Hawaiians think about Hawaii and what happened to us. So I'm very grateful that you called. Thanks very much. Privilege is mine. Privilege is mine. I have learned a ton. And uh, if I get back down to Hawaii, I will be in touch to uh, to chat it up. And, uh, yeah, we can we can swap jokes about Howley's and uh, how he's been Oh, yeah, treated. why not? Oh, everybody else does. <laughs> That's the pastime of everybody who's not Howley. Okay. <laughs> Hope to talk to you soon. 
Oh, wait a minute. I think, oh, wait a minute. If you have five minutes, I think they have, sure. we do have computer access. Maybe I can, we can get a, a question uh, or two answered. Wow. The uh, things did work out. We'll still have to be back <laughs> on the program, though, but perhaps we'll have, uh, oh, we do have, we do have a computer right on. Um, yeah, we can get a question or two. So if you've called in, hopefully you all have uh, hung tight, didn't give up on us. I will uh, get to the phone lines. And uh, you said you have a meeting, so you have maybe five minutes or so? Yeah, sure. Okay. We'll see if we can get as many as we can in five minutes. So be quick with your question, as quick as possible, direct as possible to get your question to uh, Professor Trask, and we'll try to get her back on the program so that uh, listeners will have more time to ask questions in the future. Wow, real treat, real treat. What are, can you share? Nice. It's always nice to be interviewed. Oh, for sure. It was, it was a I hope everyone can t- uh, tell from uh, the amount of laughter. I thoroughly enjoyed uh, <laughs> speaking with you. It, it was a real privilege. Um, can you share some of the other spots that you have, you have traveled to um, just while we're waiting? Well, uh, I had wonderful uh, invitations to Canada because they're filled with Native people. Yep. South Africa was a big moment for me because I'd never been to Africa, and I met so many incredible people there. Um, Europeans can be very interesting, too, depending on where you are because they have different histories. Uh, the Basques invited me. They, are, they have been oppressed for, I don't know, hundreds and hundreds of years. Uh, the Irish are incredible. Uh, same thing. They, they are the most ferocious white people I've ever met in my life. <laughs> they are just unbelievable, which is what everybody says. Um, the French are just as snooty as you think, but on the other hand, they have a great culture. Um, Eastern Europe is so underdeveloped, it's pathetic. I, I, you know, they never should have divided them up, but it's it's a sorrow because they haven't they haven't you know they haven't improved it. Um, but traveling is great because it puts yourself in the position of understanding other people who have terrible problems and a terrible past. And I always enjoy traveling for that very for that very reason. Mm, I I feel the same way. I, I definitely I can tell uh, my listeners when I. When I uh, visited Hawaii, uh, I did not have the same understanding of racism, white supremacy that I do now. Going there and hearing non-white people who are, as you said, thousands of miles away from my hometown making the exact same complaints about white people that I was making, Mm -hmm. that was a huge learning moment for me and my understanding of what is happening on the planet to say, okay, if this many people are complaining about non-white people worldwide, maybe we should just be paying more attention to these white people and what they're doing. Oh, mm-hmm. we have the switchboard. Yay! Um, I have uh, one caller at uh, last four numbers are 3456. Uh, you are on the air. Do you have a question? Uh, that might be me. Last? Yes, we can hear you. Oh, okay. Yeah, I'm a Skype caller. Um, yeah, very interesting. Um, I'm a white guy. Uh, I'm a Canadian, and uh, growing up, my best friend was uh, Sioux Indian, and uh, I had uh, lots of opportunities to go to the reserves and, you know, see how life was, and uh, I, I was not impressed. Um, and, uh, you know, as a as a white person, <laughs> a non-native. Um, you know, I find it reprehensible uh, how uh, our native people here in Canada are treated. I, uh, we have we have a serious issue in Ontario of the Aquasasi uh, tribe, uh, and uh, every now and again it flares up, and it's starting to flare up again. And uh, my question is, uh, how what kind of process uh, do you plan on going through in order to get uh, the land back? I'm just kind of curious. Well, there's several. Um, one is litigation that we've been in for over 25 years. Uh, another one is negotiation, although that'll never work because the state of Hawaii owns those lands, and so they're not going to give them up to us. And then there have been some international workings that we've tried to talk to other people to see how their countries did it. but. In essence, we're not going anywhere. I mean, uh, we don't have the power to fight the state of Hawaii. They are totally uninterested in in making even reparations. Um, I tried for years to get the University of Hawaii to say that Hawaiians should come here for free because it's sitting on stolen Hawaiian land. We didn't make any headway at all. 
my students have to pay in-state tuition just like everybody else does. So at the moment, all we've ever gotten was an apology from uh, both the United States and the state of Hawaii regarding the overthrow, and that's all. And the, and the apology, of course, is all apologies. It means nothing because the Native people, I was asked about what I thought, and I said, well, put it this way. We didn't uh, have an apology to be stolen, and we don't want one back. What we want is the two million acres of land. That's the way it's been since you know, we started our movement. So we haven't made any progress at all. Wow. I particularly like that, uh, <clears throat> your suggestion about uh, the Native Hawaiians should get free schooling at the University of Hawaii. I think that would be a phenomenal idea, uh, and I think worldwide that should be reparations for white supremacy. All non-white people can go to school for as long as they want for free. Yes, and, you know, if the Europeans can have free free for everybody, and, and South Africa does, I don't see why the United States doesn't. That's the wealth of the nation. For sure, for sure, for sure. Uh, last call for we uh, let you get to your meeting. Uh, 253, did you have a uh, question for Professor Trask? Uh, yeah, I wanted to know... Um, in your observation, how how are uh, how are black people treated in uh, in Hawaii? Thank you very much. It's very hard to say because there's so few of them. the The biggest black population is the military. Hawaii has 26 military bases, but most of us who are Hawaiian never go near the military bases. So they have their own little enclave. Um, as far as the tourist trade goes, there are some um, black tourists, but generally, again, it's usually very low. And since I can't stand Waikiki, I never go there. So I don't know what the what it even looks like. It because I, you know, I ha I refuse to go down there. I can't stand it. It just looks like one built, overbuilt uh, tourist resort, which is what it is. So I don't. I can't really say how black people are treated because I hardly know anybody who's black. And I'm never in a in a city situation where people, you know, have condominiums and hotels and stuff because I don't live on that side of the island. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Wow. Uh, again, incredible privilege to uh, have you on the program today, Professor Trask. Um, we, yeah, we've got to get you back on the program. That way we can get more uh, callers next time. But I thoroughly enjoyed it. I hope everyone will check the book out, no, uh, excuse me, from A Native Daughter and the film Act of War, uh, University of Hawaii's Professor Trask, thank you a ton for speaking with us today. Thank you. We say mahalo nui, which means thank you very much. Aloha. Ma uh, mahalo and aloha as well. I will definitely be in touch soon. Okay. Thank you. Uh, thank you all for tuning in. Second one today. Um, please, I hope you checked out the first program with uh, uh, Norm Stamper, author of Breaking Rank. Uh, and uh, yeah. I very much enjoy this program. We'll definitely have to have Professor Trask back uh, in the future. Um, <clears throat> my two cents for how black people are treated in Hawaii, I was there for two months, and I can say this. Uh, the first two weeks that I was there, I met more Italians in Hawaii than I did black people. The first two weeks that I was in Hawaii, I met more, and I mean actual Italians who came from Italy in Hawaii than I did black people. And I mean, at the time, you could get a flight to Hawaii from Las Vegas or LAX for 100 bucks. You could fly to Hawaii, and I saw more Italians than I did black people the first two weeks I was in Hawaii. So uh, I didn't see very many black people. Um, when I did see black people, we were both stunned, kind of like, what are you doing here? Where are the rest of the black people? And I, didn't find, I was there for two months, and I didn't find them, so I don't know where they are. Uh, I just don't think very many black people go to Hawaii for whatever reason. But uh, beautiful place. The Native, uh, Native Hawaiians, they can tell you a lot about uh, mistreatment, racism, white supremacy. They can uh, go chat with them. Uh, Gusty Renegade and Justice. Justice, do you have anything you'd like to say before we uh, wrap the program up? Uh-oh, might have lost her. Uh, if you're there, you can hop in. I'll say your email address for you, but uh, please hop in if you're there. Uh, Justice.asap. Hello? There she is. Pango. Did you have anything oh, you wanted to? Sorry about that. Uh, no problem. Um, Justice.asap at yahoo.com. Again, Justice.asap at yahoo.com. 
Outstanding. Uh, our, actually, one of our listeners from Austria this morning, she said she had missed hearing you on the show, and she thought she did a great job this morning. She uh, sent me a private message, but wanted to pass that along. Justice X, she was on the show this morning. Uh, great job this morning on the show, she said. Um, yes, please shoot Justice an email. Thank you all for checking out. Uh, if you checked out both programs, thank you for checking out both of them. Uh, we will be back on... Uh, Sunday, gosh, we'll be back on Sunday um, with uh, Betsy Leandar Wright. I think I'm saying her name correct, uh, correctly. Betsy Leandar Wright. She is co-author of Color of Wealth. If you uh, were listening in September, uh, Meiju Louise, she was on the program. She is also a co-author of Color of Wealth. Uh, she had a lot of constructive information. Only difference, Meiju Louise, non-white person, Betsy Leandar Wright, she is a white person, and I think she wrote the whole chapter of the book that focuses on how the system of white supremacy is designed to give out welfare, affirmative action, handouts to white people. Uh, if you look at the description for that program, she actually sent me a link uh, to additional information for how this plays out, and I think uh, the information she sent is uh, relative to her personally as a white person to how she has gotten help in accumulating resources as a white person in the system of white supremacy. So that will be Sunday at 3 p.m. Eastern, 2 p.m. Central, 12 p.m. Pacific. I will be here with Betsy Leandar Wright. Uh, thank you, everyone, for checking out the program. Favorite the show. Click the heart and the player. That would be great. Uh, we will be back. Uh, again, cows on location. I think, uh, I think we did a pretty good job of being on location, and I've never even been in this building. And we've been looking at racist material the whole time this program uh, started. I was looking at a cartoon that had uh, Bugs Bunny with uh, some stereotypical character of an Asian person acting crazy and, and all these exhibits of uh, just Asian people being mistreated at the Wing Loop Museum. If you come to Seattle anytime between now and April, Make sure you get to the International District. Go to the Wing Luke Museum. They have an incredible exhibit called Yellow Terror. Uh, it's uh, just a ton of art and different presentations experiencing how Asian people have been mistreated in the system of white supremacy. The exhibit is called Yellow Terror. Excellent. Uh, Justice and Gusty Renegade on location. Program's out. Uh, we'll be back on Sunday. Thank you for supporting the program. Please check the blog, racism-notes.blogspot.com. Uh, check out uh, Back of the Bus's blog as well, uh, nonwhitealliance.wordpress.com. Outstanding. Thank you, everybody. Uh, Lorianne Ashley, thank you for the support as well. Be back on Sunday. Cal, signing out.